I'd like to welcome you all to the, um, to the lecture. This is the Industrial Environmental Management Annual Lecture Series on Business and the Environment. I'm Reed Lipset. I'm the Associate Director of the Industrial Environmental Management Program and Chair of the Lecture Series. Um, we've been doing this lecture series for a long time, since 1992, bringing uh, business folks to campus to get their perspective on interesting issues and, and environmental management questions of the day. Um, the lecture series is supported by a, a small endowment set up in honor, actually in memory, of a, a joint degree student, Joel Amaro Kurahara, who graduated in 1992 from FES and the School of Management. He worked with uh, Conrail after he graduated and was pivotal in helping to set up the Global Environmental Management Initiative, which was an early uh, group of, an early uh, consortium of multinational, U.S. multinational companies interested in uh, trying to pursue progressive environmental approaches. When he died, his coworkers and family and folks here at the school established a fund in his memory. And it's dedicated to dialogue among the stakeholders. So the lecture series is a, a great thing to support with that fund. This year we're doing, um, we've picked a theme, industrial ecology as a source of competitive advantage. Now, most of you are students here in the program, so you know what industrial ecology is but there'll be a few people who don't. Um, this is the, I like to think of it as the, the study and pursuit of sustainable production and consumption, primarily by looking at material and energy flows at different scales. And it includes a lot of familiar concepts and tools like life cycle assessment, material flow analysis, um, sustainable materials management, industrial symbiosis. And what we, the reason why we chose this theme was because Industrial ecology has produced a lot of clever concepts and tools, and what we want to see is the ways in which they get traction in the real world, or in simpler terms, what the business case is for using these concepts and tools. So in the spring, we had um, four companies come and talk, uh, Sustain You, which makes apparel out of recycled materials, uh, domestically sourced, and Mercedes, who talked about their use of life cycle assessment in their product design, and a uh, industrial de uh, site developer or redeveloper called Foresight, and Preserve, uh, the company that uh, recycles uh, polypropylene into um, a variety of household products. And um, so now we have the um, the we are pleased to host. Um, interface. For those of you that are not immediately familiar with Interface, it, um, the, uh, the former, the now deceased CEO Ray Anderson was an iconic figure in um, environmental management and the environmental movement when he kind of got religion, as it were, about the impact of industrial activities on the environment, wrote a series of very widely read books and kind of led the charge on having large corporations pursue a sustainability agenda. Um, and a, a lot of interesting policies and technologies have emerged from the work that, that he started. Today we have uh, Mikhail Davis with us. He's the Director of Restorative Enterprise at Interface. He's worked there for four years. He started out with getting a, a Bachelor of Science degree in Earth Systems at Stanford and then worked for the, the environmental icon David Brower, who was the founder of the Sierra Club and at that time at the time that uh, Mr. Davis worked with him was um, running the Earth Island Institute. Uh, Mikhail then moved on to Blue Sky Sustainable Sustainability Consulting and finally on to Interface. He's an interesting person to talk to because he has background um, in the nonprofit world, in the consulting world, in the corporate world, and a strong foundation in science. You don't usually get people with that kind of diversity of background. The reason why I think it's great that we got him here is I started reading his blog, and it's a great blog. It's one of the few that actually has real content and it has a little sh some sharp edges, and um, I highly recommend it to you. But I should let um, Mikhail speak for himself. So what we're going to do is we're going to, he's going to present for around 45 minutes and then take question and answer. So with no further ado, 
Mikhail Davis. Thank you, Reed. Uh, thank you, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. I've never been to Yale. <clears throat> um, my father is from Connecticut, so I've been to Connecticut many times, but I've never been to this part. Beautiful architecture is what I can say, having been here for a couple hours, um, including this. <laughs> the, um, it's also a distinct pleasure to be here representing Interface. Um, as, as Reed in indicated, I have a uh, sort of strange and checkered past jumping all over in the world of sustainability. Um, but one, one of the key moments in my life was a day in, in September 1997. Uh, it was the day that I met Ray Anderson. And I met a lot of other people who have since become really famous that day, but this was a moment in my life in which I, you know, I had a good ponytail going. I was, uh, had been arrested for civil disobedience, trying to save the Redwoods. I was about to finish my degree in environmental science. Um, and I really knew a lot more about the problems we had with the environment than anything we could do to solve them. We didn't have that many classes on that. Uh, so, but then here comes this guy up on stage. And I don't, I don't know if I'd ever met a CEO of anything. And I mostly thought of CEOs as bad guys. I was, kind of raised by hippies, so the CEOs were definitely the bad guys. Um, and here comes Ray with his Georgia drawl and uh, starts speaking the environmental gospel and it becomes clear that he actually understands the environmental problem. And I've certainly never heard a business people speak in those terms. I've heard business people speak about the environment in a sort of, you know, giving it some lip service kind of way. But Ray gets it, and it's pretty clear. And you know, the thing he said that I always remember is he said, I believe one day people like me will go to jail. <laughs> I'd certainly never heard anything like that before. So, and, and the door that opened for me that day was this idea of, wow, maybe, you know, maybe business could be part of the solution here, not just the source of the problem. And, uh, and I, I didn't really walk through that door until many years later, but if you'd asked me, you know, did I ever think I'd be working for a carpet company, I probably would have told you no. <laughs> I like the best response to that I got, I told someone on a plane, you know, oh, I work for a carpet company. And they're like, well, someone's got to do it. <laughs> like, no, I love my job. <laughs> so, um, but since I met Ray, I always fantasized that I would work for Interface because the the mission is a lot bigger than carpet. It's really about proving with the tools at hand, which is a carpet company, that we can do business in a totally different way. We can make things, we can have commerce without systematically degrading you know, the basis of our life support system on the earth. So just a quick, how many show of hands here, who, has, who knows who Ray is and is pretty familiar with Interface? All right, we got about, Somewhere about half. Okay, good. This is going to be the quick overview just to make sure you kind of get the context. I think for discussing competitive strategy, it's good to understand how we do um, business, you know, what, what we are as a business. We are the world's largest manufacturer of modular carpet tiles, so carpet squares. We will pull out the handy prop. Um, you can see that it has a, like a semi rigid backing on it, which is what distinguishes it from roll carpet or broad loom. Um, we are publicly traded, so we have all of those strange incentives of publicly traded companies and, and reporting requirements and all that. We manufacture on four continents, so we are a global company. Uh, we manufacture regionally for each market, so we're not shipping carpet tile all over, which would be expensive. Um, we have about 3,800 employees, sales in over 110 countries. So. Key things to take away, we're big, but not that big. We have about a billion dollars in sales, um, and we are global, although the US is still our single biggest market. But the other thing to know about Interface, and for those of you who aren't familiar, is that we are placed on this pedestal of being one of the most important companies in the world of sustainable business. And I, I don't put this up to toot our horn, you know, we're number two. Um, we're actually number three this year. Patagonia passed us. <laughs> Probably something to do with having, you know, 
the cojones to put out an ad that said, don't buy our product unless you really need to. That's pretty hardcore. We'll have to work to match that. Uh, but we have some cool stuff we'll share with you, so maybe we'll, maybe we'll pass them. It's on, Yvonne. We're, uh, we're coming for number two. Unilever could buy us both out of petty cash, so that's a whole other category. Um, but I, I think what I like to show this slide is just to show that we're this little carpet company, but the world is really looking to us to <laughs> lead the way, which is a little bit of a scary thought, but I think we're excited about it. So here's, here's you know, when people say, you work for a carpet company? Um, this is, a, to me, one of, one of Ray's quintessential and very simple contributions to this, is just the idea that business, and this doesn't, for people who are in the forestry school, this doesn't sound that radical, but to business people, this is a radical idea. Business doesn't exist to make a profit. Business makes a profit so that it can exist, which begs the question, why do you exist? And then business has to really think about what its purpose is. So here's, here's one of the, the, the key statement that Ray came up with about what is our purpose if, if business needs to have a purpose beyond profit. So to be the first company that by its deed shows the entire industrial world what sustainability is in all of its dimensions, people, process, product, place, and profits by 2020, and in doing so, we will become restorative through the power of influence. So there's a lot there. Um, and this is not a competitive strategy, but this is really the found, this is the mission. This is what we build everything else on top of. And there's, um, the original version of this actually had the term industrial ecology in it, but uh, <laughs> so uh, for our industrial ecologist. But this idea of restorative is one we'll come back to because I took the title last year of being director of restorative enterprise. I got to write my own title. Um, because the original version of this, literally the first speech that Ray gave to Interface employees, so he, you know, if you know the story, he got asked to give this kickoff speech because customers were asking about the environment and he didn't want to give in. I don't know, I, I don't know what to say about the environment. I don't know anything about the environment, you know. We're not breaking any laws, are we? And so when he finally, he ended up, you know, through pure serendipity reading Paul Hawkins' book and having this staying up all night epiphany about how this creation he'd poured his life into, this, this entrepreneurial startup company that he'd turned into a public company, was, sudden, was actually undermining the future he wanted for his grandchildren. It's what he called his spear in the chest moment. And what he said in that very first talk, and he, he was addressing our, this new environmental committee we're forming, he said, I want you to go out and figure out how we can become the world's first restorative enterprise. Be, to be a company that not only does no harm, but puts back more than it takes from the earth. And by in doing so, to show that we can make the world better with each yard of carpet we make and sell. So that's right out of the box, Ray, is right to restorative enterprise. And we, we, we took that title to really reclaim that. It's not about, lots of people make fun of the word sustainable, and would you like it if your marriage was sustainable? And um, it's better, you know, we still gotta use the word. But I think there, there is this aspiration that people want to go beyond sustainability. We actually want to make the world a better place, and that's the legacy we want to leave, not just tolerability or sustainability or any of these other things which are less inspiring. So when Ray defines sustainability, what are we talking about, about sustainability? Eliminate waste, generate only benign emissions, use only renewable energy, Close the loop on our products and materials. Um, use resource efficient transportation. Create a cultural shift, and that means both inside the company and outside. And redesign commerce. So to some degree, you have a, a spectrum of difficulty here. <laughs> uh, but that he really, and there's a great system diagram in his first book where he explains how all of these things fit together to create a more sustainable way of doing business. Um, and I think if you look at, you know, this got rolled up into a more, a simpler to understand idea, which was mission zero. We're going to eliminate our negative impacts on the environment by 2020. This was our, our big, bold statement. Um, 
And so that's what this rolls up to. And you can see there's a lot of negative impacts we'd be eliminating in this, you know, including looking at toxic substances under benign emissions, uh, negative impacts from energy generation, et cetera. So, so you, get, you get to this, and so this is the mission, but what is the strategy? So we have to have a business strategy because Ray's philosophy was always that you don't sacrifice the financials. You know, what, what we're gonna prove to the world is that you can make, as Ray called it, a bigger and better profit. Because our model is fundamentally less useful and less influential to other companies if we're not profitable. So if we can show that we're more successful in business doing business with and eliminating our, our footprint, that's what's gonna have people you know, sh follow us. We can try to appeal to moral sensibilities and other things, but we also need to be appealing to the profit motive that has a lot of people in business in the first place. So in terms of our overall business strategy, we are a specialist in carpet tile. Most of our competitors make a lot of different kinds of flooring. Um, so we've really focused on that niche. We believe this is a better way to do soft service floor covering. Uh, so that has certain implications. We put a lot into innovating in that space. So to be the company that consistently puts out whatever the next thing is in modular carpet and to be perfecting this idea of modular carpet where you can do selective replacement, um, you can have a longer lasting product, uh, you can have less waste involved in manufacturing it and installing it. There's some fundamental promises that we keep innovating on. The, um, and so you read asked me when we were talking about this, you know, would you say that innovation is part of your competitive strategy? I would say it is. Um, we've always invested quite a bit in R&D. And if you look at it, we're not the low price company and we're not a premium brand. Um, we're really somewhere in between. We're looking to provide quality and value for price. So we're, we're all over the middle and we're not really in the low end or not in the high end. Uh, so cost reduction is good, but it's not the primary strategy driver. Um, I think that really what we're looking to, to do is to continuously make carpet tile a more attractive option by continuously innovating in this modular flooring space. And we'll unpack a little bit more um, what we mean by continuous innovation and how that that's rolls out as a strategy. Something I always like to show because Ray talked a lot, and he would show some of these, but we've, um, he would talk a lot about the vision, but I think it's always interesting to look at, well, how are we doing on this vision? How are we doing on eliminating our negative impact? Um, so here's, here's some, some key numbers. Uh, CO2 emissions per unit down 41%. This is a cumulative from 1996 um, until last year. Energy use per unit uh, down 39%. Uh, waste to landfill, 91% per unit. Uh, water use, 81%. And it's interesting, and we can talk if you want about, there are some big moves we made in each of these. There's some of it is, is continuous improvement and just iteration and having our employees engaged in thinking of new ways to eliminate waste in the process. But there's also some big moves, like you know, if you look at water, at a certain point we said, we're not gonna dye carpet yarn anymore. We're not gonna have the big vats of chemicals and water and the need to, to dry the yarn after you dye it. We're gonna use all pre-dyed, solution-dyed fiber. At the time, that was radical, it was more expensive. Um, not as many people were doing it. There was a fear that you would limit your color palette if you couldn't just custom color with, with dyeing in your factory. But it eliminated a lot of aqueous chemistry, a lot of water use. Um, a lot of energy use for, for heating the water to begin with and then drying out the yarn after you've dyed it. Um, so there's some big strategic decisions we made that, that get rolled up into these metrics. Um, cycle renewable raw materials, this is something I, I kind of specialize in this area. This is, uh, this is a global number. I have a US number is a little bit higher. But we, one of our metrics is to, is to use no materials that, don't, that aren't either bio-based and sustainably sourced or from recycled sources. Um, and then just to show you here, I'd like to show the companion sales numbers. This has been good for business. This is not do good or stuff. We're looking, consistent with Ray's philosophy, always for the way to have a win for the business and a win um, for reducing our environmental impact and showing a different way to do business. 
So you can look at, you know, obviously we've had sales growth, we've, we've become more profitable. This was a number Ray always liked, which is, it's kind of a funny metric, but it's if we had continued doing things the way we were doing them in 1996, we would have spent this much more money to produce the amount of revenue we produced. So to make all that carpet, we would have had to spend an additional nearly half a billion dollars. Um, and if you look at, and, and you can see this is another measure of, you know, we've been a profitable company during the period of this journey. But uh, one thing that stands out to you, you have this incredible trough. Um, this was the, the one, two, three punch of Y2K, which uh, all that is corporate discretionary spending got put into fixing computers and no one replaced their carpet. Um, that was around, obviously around 2099. We had the dot-com bubble burst. A lot of big corporate uh, office space ordered carpet and never paid for it, among other things. <laughs> um, and then you had, obviously you had the recession that came after 9-11. Ray and, and our CFO will, will tell you we would have been out of business had our cost basis been the same as it was previously. If it had been as expensive for us to be in business, as it had been before we implemented all of these cost saving measures around sustainability and reducing waste, we would have been seriously out of business around about 2002. Um, as it was, we were able to, to rebuild, kind of retune our strategy to be less dependent on, a corporate, on corporate office space, sell more to education and, and other markets. Um, but then you can see we were, we were able to rebuild the business from there. And what, what we really have is a more solid foundation for having made ourselves a more efficient um, operation. And that's the first, you know, like I said, cost reduction is not the primary driver of our strategy, but it gives us a certain amount of resilience in the face of market changes. And we'll talk more about this theme of resilience, which I think is a really important one that is starting to become um, understood more in sustainability circles. Because especially as we look at, there are gonna be some big changes coming, climate change not the least of them, but we have to be designing our businesses so that they really can rebound from really fundamentally changed assumptions. All right, so here we got, a, I know we have some life cycle assessment people here. There's a question that, that I very seldom get a correct answer to, but someone in this crowd probably knows it. What would you say in our little life cycle, sorry for my awkward slide here, but um, if we're making a carpet tile, what's the single biggest driver of the carbon footprint of a, of a carpet tile? Raw materials, yes. Um, it's kind of a rule of thumb for anything that doesn't move, that doesn't consume fuel or, or get burned, unless you do something really silly like fly it around the world on a plane or something. But, um, <laughs> is that the raw materials are gonna be, you know, and, and it's kind of interesting because I've delivered this more often to much less environmentally savvy audiences and mostly what people say is transportation, sometimes manufacturing, and it makes sense because we can see transportation. Everybody can see trucks going down the road. Uh, we, can, you know, we can imagine smokestacks from manufacturing and imagine that that would have a carbon footprint. Um, but it's really about raw materials, and this has very much driven our strategy around how do we create a resilient business, um, because raw materials for a manufacturer are also our single biggest cost. The materials we buy, especially the nylon, which is a, is a premium nylon, is the single biggest, most expensive thing our business buys. So if we can impact that, it also happens to be the highest single, the single biggest driver of our carbon footprint, uh, as nylon is a pretty energy intensive plastic to make. It's about 5X, a lot of I mean, polypropylene or, or it's substantially larger. So this is the, is the numbers, you know, for an average US carpet tile for us. Uh, it's 71%, so you can see you got a lot of room for improvement if you can close the loop here. If you start, oh, I have a pointer. If you, can, if you can cut out this by closing the loop, you have the potential to eliminate 71% of the carbon, foot, carbon footprint of making your product. So, because that 71%, that's the ugly stuff. That's the stuff we don't, we don't want to be associated with. Um, there's our deep water horizon. 
So it's if, if we, you know, people will talk about peak oil. I'm not nearly as concerned about peak oil or any of the scenarios in which oil becomes scarce as I am scenarios in which oil becomes so expensive that we will go anywhere and do anything to get it. So drilling really deep into unsafe depths under the ocean, uh, perfecting the strip mining of tar sands in Canada, uh, fracking all over, regardless of whether it's safe, you know, converting our, our drinking water into flammable and toxic materials. These are all things, and, and obviously these are worst case scenarios, but we are investing in the growth of those things to the degree that we still source the raw materials, the stuff of our business from these sources, we are increasing the likelihood of this, this, and, and, and this. We are also creating more neighborhoods that look like this, you know, where you, where you have people living in the shadow of either plastics refineries or oil refineries. Um, you know, in the case of nylon, you have bunch of different very high energy stages, you know, none of which you want to live next to that go into making this very durable plastic. So the strategy here, and this, this is the material strategy, which I would say is also a big part of our, our longer term competitive strategy, is that we want to be off oil. We want to be a, a business that's growth and that's success and that's profitability does not rise and fall with the crazy fluctuations of oil, which are only projected to get crazier. And so some of the, the components of that are use less energy, use less material, make it last, turn backing into backing, and we're starting to get more carpet specific, and turn fiber into fiber. We've got two main material types here. You've got the, the face fiber, the nylon, and you've got the backing, which you know most of our stuff is, is a vinyl compound. Um, and so it has, needs a whole other system for capturing that versus the nylon. And so if we can do this and make our, our business dependent on recycled streams, we buffer ourselves against the craziness that is now and is definitely coming in the world of, of you know, fossil fuels and petrochemically sourced materials. And we'll be in really good position if we ever get a price on carbon. But in the meantime, we're going to try to make this work without a price on carbon, and then we'll just be more profitable if we ever get a price on carbon. So here's just going to run you quickly through our system, what we're doing today um, for closing the loop, which I think we've seen for the carbon footprint is key. Um, it is also a key part of strategy for eliminating our overall impacts. Um, we get in truck loads full of carpet tile or broadloom carpet. Um, broadloom, we can really only harvest the nylon from it, uh, and then we have we can sell the, the other what they call the carcass of the uh, of the carpet um, through other channels, but it's not that valuable. Um, then we have to sort it in the big warehouse. We now have a lot of recycling partners in, in other areas around the country. We've been building up a network, uh, so it's not just everything has to be shipped to Georgia. Um, you have to figure out what kind of uh, nylon are we dealing with. This one's nylon 6.6. The other main kind is nylon 6. Uh, this is the machine. This is adapted from a machine in, in the Italian leather industry. It's a very precise uh, spring-loaded blade. Let me give you a little pointer. So you feed the carpet tiles onto this moving belt here that's moving this way. It goes under. There's a blade underneath this belt here that you can't see that shaves off what comes out on this belt above as fluff. And that's all pretty pure nylon that we then just have to send through a fluffing and cleaning phase. Uh, and then you end up with, and we'll talk about what happens to the rest of the, the backing, which goes into a different process. But so this fluff from here goes and gets cleaned and then baled. This is about a 700 pound bale of, of nylon fluff. Uh, this would, you know, it's, it's about this big in real life. It's actually about life size. <laughs> Um, it would probably come close to filling this room if you were to untether it because it's very compacted. <laughs> um, then uh, we send that back to our yarn suppliers. We don't make our own nylon, so we've had to develop, and we'll I'll talk a little bit more about this, but part of this world of industrial ecology is a whole different level of collaboration with your suppliers, and we can talk more about that. Um, but we've had to work. We've actually shifted our nylon supply chain because some of our suppliers wouldn't work with us on this program. We had a supplier that essentially, by refusing to 
go in and figure out how to recycle nylon 66 lost about 70 million dollars a year of our business um, another smaller company gladly said we'll try it and now they're a bigger company <laughs> and they get m most of our nylon 66 business so then we go from fluff we go into a pellet a pellet gets you know re-extruded this is the the nylon fiber where you then kind of go through a spaghetti machine turn those pellets into fiber fiber gets wound onto cones in various colors and then can be tufted into your carpet again um, for nylon six which is a bit of a technically easier recycling process we now can do hundred percent recycled content nylon six we have an oil free you know, at least in the materials used, it's still transported with oil. But we have a, an oil-free, you know, in about half of our nylon we use. And as it slashes the footprint by about half. So here's the, the other side of this. So this is a pretty traditional plastic recycling supply chain in that you are trying to isolate one kind of plastic, purify it, and then re-extrude it back into new product. So you're trying to, you're, you're trying, you, so your challenge there is getting it clean enough that it can be reused just like virgin material. This is another challenge. The backing here, once you shave off the nylon, it's still got some nylon stuck to it and it's got about three different layers made of different plastics. So this is an incredibly mix. So when you shred it up, sorry about this slide. The slide quality is fuzzy and the material is fuzzy. So it's, it's all this mixed nylon, mixed with some more rubbery parts, mixed with a tiny bit of fiberglass, mixed with some polyester. It's a mess. So <clears throat> in skimming, as I will in this over this, and then magic occurs. Um, this is a process we worked on for years to be able to take that fuzzy mess and turn it into a consistent density pellet that you can actually use just like a plastic pellet. Um, and what you're doing is you're getting the the softer plastics to envelop the fiber, the nylon fiber, which would be a problem in the backing otherwise, um, such that you don't have fibers sticking out the back of your tile, which would, which would allow water to penetrate into the back of your carpet tile. Uh, so then you get, your goal is then you get it to a continuous sheet. You spread a thin layer of pellets onto a conveyor belt. You run it under what looks like a giant steamroller, and it, press, it heats the pellets just enough that they fuse together into a continuous sheet which then you attach to the pretty top layer of the carpet and you have new carpet backing, except with no oil. So we can make about 20 to 25% of our, of our capacity to produce product on that machine, but it's a new machine. It runs slower than the, the old machine that runs the virgin material. Um, but that's, we're working on speeding that machine up and we're working on building the, the gen second generation of that machine, which we call Cool Blue. You can see we painted it blue. Um, and then you end up with carpet again. And it looks pretty, and, um, and that's what people always, there's still it's in some circles a stigma of like, oh, it's recycled, it's gonna be kind of ugly because it's made from trash. I think we're getting past that. You know, this, is a, you know, this, this product on the floor here is, is made from about 80% recycled materials. And looks none the worse for it. <laughs> so here, you know, getting back to what is this as a business strategy? So you can see where we are in terms of our overall metrics. Our 2020 goal is to be 100% recycled or renewable materials. Uh, where we're at right now, this is the US number is 49%. Um, and what that does, and, and you can say, and someone asked the very good question, you know, what is, is it more expensive to use the recycled materials? When we do that right, and we've worked at it for years to get good at it, it's at, it's at about cost parity or maybe a little bit less expensive, but there's no real cost incentive to recycle right now. You'd have to, if you ever got pricing on carbon or anything like that, then you'd be in, in business and this would be a, a slam dunk. Right now, what you have to say is that, as I was saying, the biggest win is you're out of this game. This is the price of oil and doesn't even include the last six fluctuations in more recent years. Um, we had a year in 2011 where because the carpet market for residential um, had gone down with the, the housing, the prices of the intermediates that you use to build nylon out of the petrol, so you, you take petroleum, you refine it into aromatics, the price of those aromatics went through the roof because they were actually, they were making plenty of it, but they were selling it all to India and China because they perceived that there was no market in the US because there was no market for residential carpet because the housing market was so terrible. 
So those of us in the commercial carpet business, who, which was still doing okay, suddenly were having to, we, demand was down and prices were up. And so several, a lot of our competitors had to, to call, make that awkward call to the customer and say, um, sorry, we got, we got a materials increase on our end, so we gotta raise your prices. I know we told you it was $15 a square yard, but now it's 16 or whatever it was. They had to do that, some of them, three times that year. We did it once. So we weren't, we, we weren't totally, we weren't out of that game completely, but we were insulated from these, these shocks in both the price of oil and the price of the intermediates. Um, and in the near term, that is the business strategy. We have price stability as the immediate win. Hopefully we will have price advantage in the future, especially if we start to internalize some of the externalities in the marketplace. Um, but in the meantime, we have, we have these other wins. Um, this is where we're at today. Like I said, this is a sort of chart. It's interesting when you look at Ray was talking a lot about his vision in these early years, and we really hadn't done much yet. But Ray was speaking a vision that did not exist yet. And then you can see we start to get in here where we invented our recycled backing machine. We start to get some traction with our suppliers on, you know, when we first started out, we told them, you know, around about 96, we said, whoever can figure out recycling nylon is going to get more of our business. And one of them said, it's impossible. And that was the one that lost the $70 million a year in our business. Another one said, we'll try it. And the other one, and this is uh, our supplier Aquafil, went away really determined to change their business, and, and we'll talk more about them later, but that's one of our big success stories. And so you start to, to introduce recycled backing, you start to introduce substantial quantities of recycled nylon. We're still only half, half, halfway there. Um, so this leads us to, you know, the, the second 50%, the low-hanging fruit are gone. Um, and this has led to a lot of soul searching in the last few years. Um, because you know, here's a little more detail, you can see where yarn and fiber were 36% in this, backing 51%, uh, other substrates 36%, packaging 52%. That's fairly straightforward, we just dramatically reduced our packaging. Do you want to? That's an average for what it takes to make a, um, a carpet tile with low recycled content. Which is really low. Yes, you know, if, we, if you were to take our best product, those ratios would change. Um, you know, if you took our product today, if you use the best backing and the best face fiber, it's gonna, you know, cut the carbon footprint by close to half. Um, so then your, your raw material, there's still some virgin raw materials in it, but it's, it's only about 20%. And it's a lot of those in-between layers between the backing um, and the face fiber. So it's like 71% of the cost It's in that neighborhood, but we have an expert in these things who could give you an exact number. <laughs> but that's the, the kind of leverage that it starts Yes, yes, and then it leads you to, we have, we have, among other things, we have a thermal energy issue, where the price of natural gas is ridiculously low and so all your solutions for substituting out the natural gas that runs the curing ovens don't look so good financially. So that's trying to figure out how, how could you make carpet backing without all that heat processing. Um, so there's some other challenges that then rise to the top. Um, so but I think this is, uh, once, we, uh, <laughs> once we ran the numbers on, on what, do we, what do we know how to do to reduce our footprint, and how do we get to this mission zero goal? This, this cartoon came to mind. <laughs> what people started looking at is, wow, even if we did all the stuff we know how to do, regardless of cost, we're still short. Um, we need a miracle. And then some of, one of our, our old timers who've been around since day one, Jim Hartsfeld, pointed out, he said, yeah, but keep this in perspective. We needed five miracles just to get to where we are today. So we've always been in the miracle business. So nothing has really changed. We just need some different new miracles. <laughs> and uh, so this leads us to, you know, what, what do you call a miracle in business? You call it breakthrough innovation. Business speak for miracle. Well, they frown on the word miracle. Um, 
So what's, what was our, so I would say that as I was talking about, I would say part of our recipe for success has been driving innovation. How do we figure out how to be more innovative than the competition? There's our secret weapon. Billy Ingram, no. It's not just Billy, but he's a good example. Um, he's uh, one of our engineers. He came up with a, a system. Uh, we used to, I'll give you a little bit of carpet detail here just for a second. It used to be that to make, so if you said, oh, okay, we need a carpet that's made out of red, green, and yellow, um, you go and take cones about this big of red, green, and yellow yarn, and you take about 1,080 of those, 1,080 of those, and wind them onto a giant 12-foot long beam and try to guess, the, try to make sure you have the right amount of yarn on that beam. And then you wheel that giant thing around to the tufting machine and feed the yarn into the tufting machine, and, and then you you know, haul those things all around the factory all day. So Billy had this bright idea, well, what if we could figure out a way, the, car the yarn comes in cones this big, what if we could figure out a way to make carpet off of the cones and not do that beam thing? So his innovation was called a portable creel. It looks sort of like a tall airline service cart with a bunch of horizontal pegs in it that you hang cones of yarn on. You take them out of the box, the supplier sent them to you, hang the right color on there, wheel them up to the machine, done. No unspooling 1,080 cones <laughs> onto a giant beam. That, that took our yarn. We used to waste about 18% of the yarn we buy. And that is the single most expensive thing we buy. So we paid for a lot of sustainability investment just with that innovation. <laughs> but, but I would say that one of the sources of the innovation is our mission. And, and Ray put it very clearly to the company, and I think this is... The first way to innovate is to get your people excited, get them excited about doing something other than just their job. This is bigger than your job. So Ray came to the factory and he, he would remind people, said, you have a choice. You can come to the factory every day to make carpet. You're gonna do that anyway. Or you can come to the factory every day to make history. People like that. And so we, we got, a lot of, got a lot of innovation mileage out of that from everyone from our lead carpet designer um, who was just suddenly on fire and came up with all these new ideas, um, to Billy, to people on the factory floor who were contributing ways to reduce waste. Um, we created incentive programs to grease the skids with some, some cash bonuses, which never hurts. Um, but really to, to seeing that, you know, being able to consistently produce innovation it was the key to our, our competitiveness. Um, So here's another way that we put it. This is, is an iteration. People started asking, we've been doing sustainability for long enough. People started asking like, oh, we're doing Mission Zero. Is that different from the seven fronts? And now we're introducing lean manufacturing. So is that replacing Mission Zero? So we said, no, it's all the same thing. It all fits on this giant complicated mountain diagram. <laughs> um, but there were a couple of things we wanted to underline here. And uh, we built Simon Sinek's start with Y into this too, just to totally layer on another thing. Our purpose is really front seven, redesign commerce. That's where we're headed, that's the top of the mountain. It's not about just reducing our footprint, it's about showing a new way to do business um, and really getting on this journey to being restorative. We wanted to bring the restorative back in. Um, and then we also wanted to point out that front six is actually the foundation for everything else we do. We're not gonna, gonna eliminate waste or do any of these other fronts, front one, eliminate waste, front two, front three, if we don't have our people engaged, our suppliers engaged, and, and even our customers engaged, if our customers don't care, that's gonna make all of this harder. This is gonna, is gonna grease everything else we do if we can get this shift toward people understanding and caring about sustainability. That's why we you know, do educational talks. We do have made a strong outreach effort. You know, Ray's not with us anymore, but we have other people going around and, and talking. Um, so here's, an, here's another aspect of innovation. One cartoon is good, two is better. <laughs> I like this, this one, but the thing I want to point out in here is, here's the other part of the recipe for reliably producing miracles or breakthrough innovation. Get other people doing it. <laughs> you can't do it by yourself. I think that that's the lesson of the second 50% for us is that we, we really have to collaborate more. We have to 
to open wide this. There's, you know, to some degree early on we collaborated and we went and we listened more carefully to people that the industry hadn't been listening to. And it was amazing how much free help we got when you suddenly had the CEO going to Amory Levins and Paul Hawken and Bill McDonough and all these other people and saying, we're actually going to do what you tell us to do. And they were willing to give us quite a bit of free advice and ultimately some of them became consultants. But um, because no CEO had ever said that to them before. So we leveraged quite a bit of that, but now we're kind of into totally unexplored territory. And so we need, we need your help. <laughs> we need a lot of people's help. I'm gonna, we need this guy's help. Is there our other secret weapon? You know, if the Geico Gecko could work that magic, you know, maybe the newt can help with the carpet. Uh, no, as he is standing in for his other uh, millions of species. Nature is another source of our, we have gotten a lot of mileage out of looking to nature and, and the solutions nature has developed and the strategies. And first and foremost, it's a way to get us out of our old thinking. If we start to ask, how would nature do this? It immediately sets us off on all these other directions, which is what you need to reliably produce innovation. So this was one of our first big wins. And this, is, this goes to what I would say, there are two things that if, you know, when I, when I look at the landscape, which has become very crowded in Carbitile. We started out as the only one doing it, and now everybody does it. <clears throat> but there are two innovations I'll point to, and both of them come from biomimicry and, and this innovation process we started. First one we sent, you know, early on, uh, we sent some rather confused carpet designers out into the forest and said, we want you to think about how would nature design a carpet? Uh, <laughs> Once they got over being confused, they started to notice some interesting things, which is that nature doesn't use repeating patterns. If you made this into, cut it into carpet squares, every one of them would be different. And you could lay them in any direction you wanted, in any orientation, and it'd be really hard to notice if you made an error in manufacturing, and it'd be really difficult to install them wrong. In fact, you can install them in any direction. And this you know, sounds like a minor thing, but this is revolutionary in manufacturing. Manufacturing is all about making identical widgets. So the idea that you could have a product that actually works better if you make each widget, each widget different is pretty paradigm busting. Um, and I could go on, this, this is also really difficult to spot stains on, really difficult to make a manufacturing error on, really difficult to make an installation error. And because it looks like it's supposed to for longer, it lasts longer. The lifetime of a carpet is entirely determined by appearance. Um, and so if you create a product like this that lasts longer, uh, or that looks good longer, you've created a more durable and thus lower footprint product. Quickly, another example of biomimicry, we said, well, that worked well for coming up with this totally new idea. We actually got to patent the random carpet. Um, if someone copies it too closely, they have to pay us a royalty, and a lot of people did, so. <laughs> Um, once they realized the advantage of it. So we started looking at, well, okay, well, what does nature have to say about glue? Because glue is a mess. And, and how could we have better glue? So this is a process, and we'll dip into this just for a second. Biomimicry is a lot about getting to the right question. And so we started out, okay, how would nature improve the glue for installing carpet? You start to look at nature, and you start to realize, uh, okay, we need to re refine our question a little so nature can answer it. How would nature create glue? There actually are relatively few examples in nature of using glue. Uh, it turns out to not be a very nature, uh, not a common strategy. You've got some mollusks sticking to rocks in the surf and some other things, and those are other great biomimicry innovations. Um, but what we started looking at is, is we need to broaden our question. How would nature keep things on the ground or keep things in place? We came up with a, we started, we did a whole bunch of research into geckos, back to the gecko. Um, can do magical things. They can stick to the walls with no glue, just by the incredible amount of surface area the microstructures on its pads give it, uses van der Waals forces. Um, we did not end up using this strategy. We actually found that if you're actually, if you're talking about keeping things on the floor, nature really only keeps things on the floor with one mechanism, gravity. So what we did is we eliminated glue. We stuck the tiles to each other to optimize gravity. So if you have two pounds of pressure keeps this tile on the floor, if you link it to 30 other ones, suddenly you have 60 pounds of pressure and it's not going anywhere. 
So what you have, this is essentially just a glorified and very technical uh, piece of tape um, that connects, it goes under the carpet here, connects to each of the four squares, and it links them together, and it's completely not connected. It actually now puts us into creating a floating floor uh, rather than gluing to the par carpet, which makes the carpet easier to replace, makes the carpet more modular, makes the carpet easier if you wanted to change around the pattern, you could do that. Yes, you can barely see it, but this is the is one fourth of it because the other quarters of it are under right here. And it's about this big. So you can see this isn't literally what nature would do, but this line of thinking came from this inquiry into nature. And so it's really about having reliable processes for producing innovation. And with biomimicry, you have a reliable process that also gets you to more sustainable solutions because you don't tend to find really many really wasteful solutions in nature. Um, quickly on the collaboration side, and I'm gonna get to showing you a little video, um, which is really cool. One of our biggest, so we, Giulio Bonazzi was a mid-level um, sales executive at the Italian uh, engineer plastics firm Aquafil, which made a small amount of carpet yarn for us in 1997. He came to a big meeting with Ray Anderson, and Ray Anderson did his evangelical thing on, uh, on sustainability. And he went back to Italy and said, we gotta change our business, this is the future. He got it. He was a mid-level guy. Now he's the president of the whole thing. Aquafil is a much bigger company, one of our biggest suppliers, and we can get 100% recycled nylon. So you can see that one of the keys here, engaging people. <laughs> we engage this one guy, and suddenly the impossible you know, which was recycling nylon back in 97, becomes possible. They have their magic, you know, regeneration, depolymerization machine. They can turn any source of nylon six into virgin, indistinguishable from virgin 100% uh, recycled nylon. The other cool thing is that we can actually now say that our nylon has something to do with saving the sea turtle. Pretty cool. Even I could sell carpet. <laughs> um, because what, what Aquafil discovered is that a huge number of the monofilament nets in the world are made, also made from nylon six. And if you can pay people to give you their old nets, rather than dumping them overboard, which is the cheapest way to dispose of them, or rather than piling them in a port, um, you keep nets out of the water to stop this phenomenon called phantom fishing, which catches fish, you know, people dump their nets overboard. It's estimated that about 640, let me see if I have the number here, I think it's 640,000 tons a year of fishing nets are dumped overboard. So we're creating an economic incentive for people to not pile them up in the port here, um, not throw them overboard, and we can, we can use this very valuable material to make carpet yarn in Aquafil's system. Of course, we decided to make the life more difficult, and we said, wow, if you can do fishing nets, what if we sourced fishing nets from people that really need the money? I mean, where would be the best place in the world? There's fishing nets everywhere to source fishing nets from. So we started, we said, well, how about Southeast Asia? They got a lot of fishing nets and it's a mess. This is, uh... so we started a pilot project and I wanna see if I can show you a, um, a video here. This is, to me, is the frontier both for, for nylon recycling, but also for, for if we wanna be a restorative business this, to me, has, it's a really small project still. It's in about 26 villages. Um, but this, to me, is in a lot of exciting questions it raises. The livelihoods of people in this part of the Philippines is completely dependent upon the sea, one way or another. The Nang Bank is now one of the most degraded coral reefs in the world, some of the highest fishing pressure. Fishers use, especially in the Philippines, use a lot of monofilament nylon nets where you can discard them, nets go from the environment and they just hang around, they can last for 600 plus years. This is a really high performance engineering plastic, you know, nylon six is in our carpet, it's also in lots of other products that people will use every day, so we want to make sure that material can be used again. Networks is a program that takes discarded fishing nets from impoverished communities and recycles them into carpet tile. The idea is to collect discarded fishing nets off the beaches or get them from um, fishers as soon as they have finished using them. What's really important about this program is that it's not a one-shot beach cleanup. 
for some nice pictures. It's actually about how do you institutionalize nets and ultimately other material recycling in communities in a way that benefits them in the long term. <laughs> The product is still our product, beautiful carpet tile, it will look the same, but there'll be this story behind the material. This to me is the start of the genuine story of enterprise. And we're giving back and giving opportunities that are way beyond what maybe people would think a carpet tile company could do. Uh, and this is only the beginning. So if you want innovation, you need a lot to think about unlikely collaborators. Uh, so everyone from fishermen in the Philippines to the Zoological Society of London, uh, to some of the local NGOs we work with, to our nylon supplier, those were all involved in, in making that project work, which I think is one of the more exciting things I, I've seen in a while. And I'm pretty finicky about recycling programs. Um, but I think I'm going to, going to stop there. And uh, I look to you for questions and other discussion topics. Um, so I just had a quick question. If you guys have been looking at any industrial crops to use as sustainable sources for the plastic, plastic inputs. Yeah, I, I've been going to some biomaterials uh, conferences lately. It's, it's definitely out in the area of um, R&D, um, in, in part because of the market readiness of a lot of the, these crops is limited. We did a, a flirtation, and, and we actually released a product line with corn-based PLA in the mid-2000s to try to push the, a new and promising material along, but it turned out to be a pretty poor material for making carpet. and the, Recycling or composting infrastructure wasn't ready for it, so, and then Walmart bought all of the remaining stock of PLA, and then we decided we were done. <laughs> um, so, but there, there's we have released a, you know, a couple styles of bio-based nylon in Europe, just sort of a pilot of. Um, it works technically; it's very expensive, so it's kind of a premium product. Um, but uh, and then we we been looking at all sorts of different things. Where there's you know, kind of your two classes. You're either looking at novel polymers that are totally new things you can make out of bio-based, or you're looking at drop-in polymers where you're saying, okay, it's the same as normal polyester. It's kind of like plant bottle, but we're able to make the chemicals for it um, out of. So you still have the recycling issues and the you know, probably over-durability issues. It's not going to decompose, but you could theoretically recycle these drop-in plastics that have bio-based chemistry with, you know, that's what Coke is betting on, is that they can recycle their old PET bottles with the plant bottles because it's the same chemistry, but from plants instead of oil. Um, so it's a little bit further out there, but it's part of what our thinking. I'm wondering, first one is, so uh, we have, s we can see a, a very, uh, you know, interesting increase of the percentage of recycled and uh, bio-based materials I'm wondering, in this period, you must have um, developed some technologies that can, um, you know, make, um, make this increase possible. And I'm wondering what kind of technology, technological or other progress you have made in this period, and then what are the, the main uh, barriers today for you to increase it from uh, fifty percent to one hundred percent. Yeah. And uh, s the second one is that um, related to this increase, is there any other curve which can show us uh, the cost of using recycled and bio-based materials compared to the primary raw materials? Yeah, I I would say that. Um, on the first question, there definitely, and it's, it's very nonlinear because there were p distinct pieces, of, there were distinct breakthroughs in there. So one of the big breakthroughs was initially there was a cap on how much 
we could recycle because we had so much fiber. If you just take this carpet tile and chop it up and try to make backing out of it, you have way you have a lot of fiber in there, and it makes can make to make for a fuzzy and off quality backing. And so we had to mix in plastic from other sources, so it couldn't be 100% recycled. And when we figured out how we could get a blade precise enough to shave this, take off most of the nylon before we turned it into backing, then we, we took a, one of the lids off of So that was a new piece of technology for clean separation. Um, the next one was, was actually the new technology for making, for making, for being able to take that crumb um, from, gr from grinding up an old tile and to be able to make a, an equally performing new backing. Um, and then we had several breakthroughs with our suppliers going from, you know, you can't recycle to, you can't use recycled content and still get the same quality and color in your carpet yarn. Um, those also, once they said, oh, actually we figured it out, now we can do 20%. And then another one said, well, we can do 30%. And so created this nice race to the top where they were vying, you know, the guys who've, who've got to 100% are uh, sitting pretty right now. Our last three years of new styles have all been released on their fiber and the other guys are scrambling to figure out how they can compete because one of the, the obstacles to get to that question is that uh, nylon 6.6, which is traditionally, it's about half of what we produce. Um, the technology is not as developed and there are some chemical roadblocks in terms of, it's a different chemistry than nylon 6 and it's harder to recycle. Um, so there's a, you know, I can get you into technical details on that, but nylon 6.6 is one of our stumbling blocks. In terms of the backing, the biggest challenge is capacity. Our machine only runs so fast. We need to build, to make that machine run faster to kind of iterate on the technology. We also have blueprints for a whole new machine. And so it's an interesting challenge. Once we get the machines running faster, then the challenge will be, are we getting back enough carpet tile to feed it? And then we'll have to get serious about, right now we get back plenty of carpet tile. We probably get back more than we need. Um, we have to hold on to some of it. But overnight, if we were to double the speed of that machine, we would suddenly have the opposite problem. We'd have to figure out how to make sure people are sending old carpet tile back to us at a whole other rate than they do today. Um, so that would, that would be a future obstacle. Um, the, uh, and then the cost is, is interesting because we buy, in nylon, we buy a premium grade of nylon anyway. Um, because you need it to be really durable for commercial carpet. Um, and I think that you know, it's hard to say whether we're paying more than you would for another premium nylon um, to get the higher recycled content. I think we buy enough of it that we do pretty well on the price. The other thing I'll point out is we are now our supplier's supplier. We harvest so much old carpet and send back fluff to them that they're really dependent on us as a supplier of post-consumer carpet to make into new yarn just as we are dependent on them as a supplier of new finished yarn to make carpet. So we actually have some pretty interesting and innovative pricing and supply agreements that go both ways because we are now you know, in a sort of closed loop supply chain with our yarn suppliers. I have a quick question. If yeah. That's okay. Um, first of all, thank you very much. This was great. Um, you seem to hold a bit of a monopoly in the sustainable carpet company. Um, I might be wrong, but it... It seems like our that's competitors what wouldn't say so. <laughs> so I'm wondering <laughs> about your competition. If you think of your competitors more as companies like Patagonia and Unilever, who don't make the same products, but who are you know fighting for the sustainability title, or other high quality carpet companies. Um, Definitely carpet that. companies. I mean, there's okay. a friendly competition, and I think it's much more friendly than it is competition. Um, and we have gone out of our way over the years to help up and coming. Or, or established companies that committed to sustainability to, to do more of that. I know the, you know, just about the first meeting ever where Walmart said, we are interested in sustainability, Ray Anderson raced out to you know, be at that, that meeting. Um, so that was, you know, so very much that's not our competitor. That's in fact the people that we want to support. Right. Um, there's too few of us still that really understand this and are deeply invested in it. Um, it's interesting, there's a wonderful race on in the carpet industry to figure out everyone now claims they're the most sustainable and uh, um, we're kind of responding to that by trying to drive to, to new increased standards for transparency. It's like, okay, well release all of your third party verified LCA data if you're the most sustainable. Um, because now everyone has a green claim in our space and, and we really have shifted the whole marketplace, which is great. 
um, but I still think we're probably, you know, they got a ways to go to catch up to us. I think it's uh, pretty amazing that what you have been doing with the old carpets and fishing nets. So I'm wondering uh, whether you are using it just as a, to create a niche only for your company, or are you trying to push the whole industry, your competitors forward to do the same thing as you are doing? And uh, what would you expect if they, they will be doing the similar things? Will it affect your recycling supply and other things? It's, I mean, the supply question is interesting because eventually it'll, it'll be an issue. Right now, the thing I'll point to, the Aquafil example with their 100% their, uh, recycled nylon is a great example of how we've, we've shifted the landscape, not just our own supply chain, because we're not the only one that buys that yarn anymore. We were the people they developed it for because they knew we were a big customer and we would buy it. But now they sell 100% recycled nylon to some of our competitors. We don't have an exclusive on it, um, but we do have an we do have a, a special arrangement because we supply them with so much post consumer content. Um, so that's we have a bit of a, a special deal in that way. But we've really now there is 100% recycled nylon on the market that wouldn't have been had we not pushed them all these years. Uh, available not just for us. Um, I would also point out that especially in the carpet industry, which is it's one of these kind of incestuous little too, everyone knows everybody a little too well industries because everyone's based in Georgia. The best way to drive your competitors to do something is to do it first. And, and that the, com the competitive drive is so strong in the carpet industry that, that people sometimes say, well, why don't you just give away your technology? Um, like, that actually would probably be less effective in our industry. <laughs> Um, and there are certain things where we have kept our patent very broad, and we, unless someone's literally knocking off exactly what we're doing, um, you know, we didn't create a real strict, when we created, you know, randomized carpet styles, which turned out to be way more revolutionary than anyone thought, everybody came, came out with them. But unless they literally copied our pattern, we didn't call in for patent infringement. Um, and uh, because we, we did recognize it's a better way to do flooring, we don't want to, you know, slow the evolution of the whole industry. In fact, we'd like it to advance faster, but we'd like to be there first for at least a little while. Hi, um, thanks for coming in today. I just wanted to ask you, um, when, I, when you were talking about biomimicry, I thought, wow, okay, this is really different, really, really different for a company that's just making um, carpet, you know? And I'm wondering wh what you had to do with your, you know, um, your human and, and, and intellectual capital, um, any changes you had to make to that to be able to look at nature and, and, and assess it and, and go, you know what, that's a really good idea, we should try and do that. Whereas, was it people that were already on board, like your engineers, or were you bringing in biologists? Or can you just talk about how, as you've gone on this journey, how um, the structure, or the types of people you look for have changed? That's an interesting question, because Interface has a culture of very much, there's people who have been there, for, many people have been there for 30 plus years. It is a very sort of family oriented, it's still based mostly all in the same area where Ray Anderson grew up, though it's grown hugely since then. Um, so a lot of what we've done is just is getting our people, our the existing people new ideas. We certainly have attracted a whole bunch of people that would never have wanted to work in carpet um, because of the sustainability mission. And I think we, we've seen that, you know, we, you know, have you know, I met a guy the other day who was actually a retired electrical engineer who'd already made a fortune, you know, being the guy that, that invented the scanners that could make sure all the apples at the supermarket were the same color red. He came out of retirement to work for Interface because it seemed like such a cool thing to do. So that's an interesting example um, of, we have an ability to, uh, to attract new people. A lot of it is we just have gotten our, the people who already know how to make carpet, some new twists on how to do that. Um, but we've also drawn in some people from totally different industries who are adding some new perspectives. The other thing, um, early on we did bring in biologists. Um, Janine Benyus and, and some of her friends came in and they were the ones that took the carpet designers out into the woods. And, uh, but we've also tried to develop some of that capacity internally and, and some of that happens organically. Like we had a couple of people who were in R&D say, well, I actually have a master's degree in biology too. You know, and they took to biomimicry really quickly and started becoming internal champions for that. 
Right now, we're kind of trying to get a bit more formalized with that. I'm doing the biomimicry um, certificate program, which is an eight-month program to learn their whole process of how to do biomimicry innovation. Uh, my boss did the two-year program. So right now, we are in a process of investing in some more biomimicry capacity internally, um, in addition to bringing in biomimicry 3.8 um, periodically as an outside consultants. Um, because like I said, where it's at right now, and we just created a new global, what we call co-innovation team, is we don't know how to get the other 50%. So we need to be drawing in all of ideas from everywhere. We need to have a, an open innovation model, and we need to be increasing our own internal capacity to drive innovation. That's this miracle machine we need to create. You mentioned that uh, about 15 years ago, it was pretty uncommon to recycle nylon over here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the supply chain um, to bulk use carpets and bring it to your factory. Because I imagine that in order for this system of recycling to be effective, both from a profit standpoint, that you don't have to spend so much on transportation from all these in little hubs, and also from um, a carbon standpoint that you're, not, that you're also not wasting a lot of resources on this, that you would have to develop a distribution network that, that would essentially um, systematize and, and bulk all these used carpets together. Yeah, it definitely is a challenge because, you know, I think it's interesting if you point out that the, the old way to get materials for to make carpet was you pick up the phone and you call DuPont and say, we'll need another three million pounds, done. Now our supply chain looks like you know hundreds of guys with pickup trucks at construction sites, um, and then congregating at, at local recyclers, and and then getting from there up to aggregating to eventually get back to our yarn suppliers, who then have to figure out is this a le right level of purity, um, you know, for what we need for the specification. So it's a much more <laughs> uh, complex supply chain, um, and. It's made more complex by the fact that the main source of nylon is still broadloom, both due to that historically, you know, what's being pulled out is you know, so carpet tile is kind of taking ground year by year against broadloom, but what's getting pulled out is still mostly broadloom. So there are technical challenges with getting the nylon out of broadloom that not everyone has the equipment to do that. Um, there's also the challenge of what to do with the rest of the carpet, the carcass. They call it that not because they like it. Um, the carcass is the part we don't want. <laughs> Um, once, you've, once you've taken off the nylon, which is very valuable, um, you can sell it to auto parts and you can now you can sell it back to the carpet industry. Um, so we've been trying to build up regional collection networks and essentially supply agreements with local recyclers, which really helps them because they're, it's a tough business. When you, when you have a business where you are bringing in truckloads of, of stuff from different job sites and at any given time, you know, first, the, your first challenge is that a certain portion of that is going to be polyester carpet, which is totally valueless. And as soon as you accept it, you're on the hook for disposing of it. So it's a cost. Not only can you not make money on it. The next part is, okay, so then you get your, you separate out, you know, the really low pile broadloom that looks like this using commercial settings. Not everyone can even use that. That might be just as valueless to you as the polyester carpet. Um, so there's another chunk that you can't make money on and maybe you even have to pay to dispose of. And so what you really need is you need the, the higher pile, you know, nylon carpet, and then you can make money only off about 20% of that by weight, and then you still have to deal with the carcass. So it's a difficult business the way it's structured to make money in. Um, and there will be hopefully some new aftermarkets for some of the carcass and some of these other things. Um, but right now it's very much dependent on the value of the nylon, and that creates a challenge. So we've tried to give some stability to these recyclers and say, we will buy whatever you get of these classes of nylon. We've helped some of them install machinery that can get it up to our spec so that they can, be, they can reliably hit our yarn vendor's specification for how clean it needs to be. Uh, so we've essentially become investors in some of these regional recyclers. Uh, but it is a process of building. But uh, we now ship just of nylon six over 12 million pounds a year back to our nylon supplier. And that's all from North America. Um, so it's, it's a process, and, and 
we have to do everything we can to support the viability of local recyclers because it's a challenging business right now. Um, you have a, you know, some subsidies now in California, very minor subsidy. You get a, an additional five cents per pound that you recycle, um, which is as close as we have to extended producer responsibility for carpet so far in the US. Um, but it's something, it's a start. Okay, so following up actually on the California incentive and EPR, my question is um, obviously if there is some other incentive for customers to handle this carpet in a more appropriate way, uh, that's a source of competitive advantage for you. To what extent does Interface actually do lobbying or participate in industry groups to, to try to change the legislative landscape? That's an interesting question because that's uh, coming from advocacy as I do. Um, I had that question initially, and we don't, for whatever reason, have a lot of history. The, the main advocacy we did was at the national level, and that was Ray Anderson personally. Um, and without Ray especially, there's, there's not a lot of that. We have a few people that, that monitor EPR legislation, and we will go in strategically and, and provide comment or put in a word. Because you understand, most of our industry, and as far as I know everyone but us, is actively lobbying against EPR for carpet. Um, and sometimes we just say nothing, and there have been a few times where we've gone in on a bill and either behind the scenes and only once in California publicly advocated for, you know, for an EPR bill. But it's not, I can't say it's a strong area for us. We do believe in shaping the marketplace, but we don't have a lot of on-staff skill or resources devoted to that. Um, but I do think it's important. I think it's, I would say our primary focus is making our own system as economically efficient as possible so that if we ever did get a push either through a mandate or through a subsidy we'll be ready to either be way more profitable than the competition or at least to not lose as much money as they will having to comply Might be a hint. Um, so my question is actually, you mentioned that in the beginning, uh, your suppliers told you, well, you know, it's recycled, we won't be able to get good quality fibers out of this and so on. And I was wondering, and then they, you know, they went back, they did some homework and they found out that they could, although the biggest one uh, dropped out. So I was wondering if you kind of um, have the same thing on the consumer side or how much reluctance to actually use carpets that have recycled content in them uh, you find, you know, on that side and whether it's a good sales pitch to say, hey, this carpet is, you know, 100% recyclable, recycled. Um, fortunately, and I think you can look historically, there that was a problem, but I, I haven't heard anything like that. I think it's just that it's so mainstream now with, with lead putting in incentives for recycled content, um, and also you just look at it and you'd be like, that's pretty, nothing wrong with that. You know, the, the proof is kind of, you know, at a certain level, our, a lot of our customers are deciding on aesthetic and it looks good. And, and if you were to, if you, it's not, we have specifically always avoided that phenomenon which has plagued green products of, you know, you come out too early with a product that isn't ready and it's super ugly and it gives all green products a bad name. So we haven't really had that kind of backlash um, I think, but I also think that, that the research that our designers are doing shows that it, that, that sentiment doesn't exist, except there's some personal care and some other categories where recycled content is still a bit uh, taboo, or there's this connotation that it's unsanitary in some ways. But for carpet and for building products in general, that, that really is not, um, is not as much of an issue. The association with recycling is actually mostly very, very positive, which is nice to not have that hurdle to overcome. Did that answer your question? You're very welcome.